Today, I want to talk about cardiovascular disease since it's entrenched in our society as the number one killer of Americans today. Heart disease kills an estimated 800,000 people every year. Now, heart disease can take many forms. You can have high blood pressure. You can have arthrosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, congestive heart failure, cerebrovascular disease, and then finally stroke and heart attack. Now, this is an epidemic that's inescapable merely because of the environment that we live in. We are bombarded by sugar, fast food restaurants, poor diet, sedentary lifestyles, and bad habits such as smoking, and all of this has shortened our lives significantly. The short life that we do have may not be one of good quality. Now, contrary to the popular expression, what does not kill us makes us stronger is actually the opposite. What does not kill us makes us weaker and sicker. Now, if most of us is going to die from a heart attack, we first need to know how we eventually got there in the first place, step by step. How does it all start? Well, a heart attack occurs when there's a sudden blockage of blood flow through the coronary arteries that feed the heart. Now, initially, there's a, nor there's a narrowing of the coronary arteries, which stem from plaque formation. And then this decreases the contract strength, contractile strength of the heart and also the uh, exercise tolerance. Now, however, when a blood clot lodges in an already narrowed coronary artery, a heart attack inevitably happens, resulting in either heart damage or death. So obviously, plaque formation exponentially increases your risk of having a heart attack. So what causes plaque formation so we can actually prevent it? Well, in one word, inflammation. So what causes inflammation? Well, everything causes inflammation, breathing, walking, exercise, there will always be very small amounts of inflammation from our everyday activities, and that's okay. Our bodies can handle mild temporary inflammation. However, after a certain threshold, continuous chronic inflammation can cause a lot of damage. Actually, inflammation is the beginning of virtually all diseases. There are a few reasons why some of our routine activities may be the cause for chronic inflammation. So today, I'm going to give you the six main reasons for chronic inflammation. And then later in another video, I'll show you how to reverse the damage that has already been done. The first main reason for chronic inflammation is the ratio between omega-6 fats to omega-3 fats. Omega-6 fats are pro-inflammatory, while omega-3 fats are anti-inflammatory. Now, ideally you want to keep a ratio of one to one between the two. And in American diet, you have a ratio of about 18 to one which would cause an inflammatory state. And that's roughly about 18 times more than normal. Now, how this actually happens is by the development of arachidonic acid. Now, all you need to know about arachidonic acid is that the end result causes inflammation throughout the body. It's not necessarily bad. We need inflammation to start the healing process, but too much ongoing inflammation is not a good thing. Now, I'm not going to bog you down with the details of the, bio, with the biochemical pathways, but omega-6 fats convert into arachidonic acid while omega-3 fats don't. That's why supplementing with omega-3s are stressed so much. Omega-3 fats convert into a compound called icosopentoic acid, aka EPA, which is an anti-inflammatory. If you decrease the amount of omega-6 fats in your diet and increase the amount of omega-3 fats in your diet, you significantly reduce the amount of inflammation going on in your body. We get a majority of our omega-6 fats from polyunsaturated fat, fatty acids, aka PUFAs, like corn oil, canola oil, uh, safflower oil, soybean oil. We get our omega-3 fats from fish oil, flaxseed oils, and chia seeds. Now, instead of cooking with polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are unstable, and we can easily, they, they also can get really rancid too. Um, with heat, but you can cook with saturated fatty acids like coconut oil, palm oil, butter, animal fat, lard, which are more stable. Even olive oil, which consists of only monosaturated fats and some polyunsaturated fats is okay. It's almost a must that you take omega-3 fats daily or suffer the consequences. The second main reason for chronic inflammation is oxidized oils. Not only should you be aware of the amount of omega-6 fats that you're consuming, you should also know which oils are stable. Oils can be easily oxidized or rancid when exposed to heat, light, oxygen, or acidity. 
Some oils are more resistant than others. Now, the higher the temperature, the more oxidized or rancid the oils become. Now, don't get me wrong, you need oils for your brain and your cell membranes, but only when they're but when they're oxidized, they can cause oxidation of your cholesterol and produce all these free radicals. Now, it's the free radicals that cause the blood vessel damage. And when you have blood vessel damage, you have inflammation of the blood vessel lining. Remember, you had the good cholesterol and you had the bad cholesterol. Well, very recently, cholesterol has been vindicated from the terrible foods to eat. So you got the HDL and LDL, which are actually good per se. It's only when the LDLs become oxidized that they cause a problem. There are two types of LDLs. You got the large particle LDLs and the small particle LDLs. It's the small dense particle sized LDLs that are oxidized and they seep through the inflamed blood vessels. The large particle LDLs encases the inflamed areas within this plaque to compartmentalize the damage. So with ongoing inflammation, you have this continued plaque formation and narrowing of the arteries leading to peripheral vascular disease and coronary artery disease. So the third main reason for chronic inflammation is sugar. And when I say sugar, I mean simple and complex sugars, all carbohydrates, wheat, sucrose, sucralose, and let's not forget high fructose corn syrup. Now, many years ago, sugar used to be a condiment. Now it takes up more than half the American diet. Now, there isn't even a minimal daily requirement for sugar. It's the one macronutrient that we don't need to live. So the thing about sugar is that it causes inflammation in a couple of ways. Sugar and sugar containing foods have a high glycemic index. This means consumption will lead to a huge spike in blood sugar, leading to a huge spike in insulin. And it's the insulin that causes the production of arachidonic acid, which again leads to an inflammatory state. Secondly, the insulin also causes an increase in fat stores. Fat cells secrete inflammatory cytokines leading to an inflammatory state. So the more fat cells that you have, the more inflammation that you have. Now, under this sugar umbrella, you also have high fructose corn syrup, which is different which is a different kind of monster altogether, okay? This is like sugar on steroids. Now, research studies have linked high fructose corn syrup with a condition called metabolic syndrome, which presents with high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, and obesity. This greatly increases the risk of cardiovascular disease and ultimately can result in a heart attack. High fructose corn syrup made its inception about 40 years ago, showing up in soft drinks, replacing regular cane sugar. Back then, people used to drink like two soft drinks a week, whereas now today, people are drinking about two soft drinks a day. And we're not even talking about those who are drinking one to two liters of soda a day and those who just completely replaced their water with just plain soda. So now, high fructose corn syrup is everywhere. I mean, you can find it in ketchup, baby formula. You can even find it in bread. The name has gotten such a bad rap that they even tried to disguise it, but it's the same stuff corn syrup, crystalline fructose, fructose, fruit fructose, maize syrup, glucose syrup, tapioca syrup, dahlia syrup, any kind of syrup for that matter. Just stay away from it. The fourth main reason for chronic inflammation is stress. Stress can lead to inflammation by basically causing hypertension. Our fight or fight response is triggered by stress. You get secretion of cortisol and adrenaline which are basically help, it helps the body to adapt to stressful situations. This is helpful for the short term, but not so good for the long term. You can cause significant damage. Hypertension is an increase of blood pressure within the blood vessels. This can be caused mainly by too much fluid in the vasculature system, hardening of the arteries, or in a case of stress, basically increased contractility of the heart. Now, these, this basically leads to shear forces and micro tears against the vessel walls throughout the whole cardiovascular system and ultimately leads to widespread inflammation. Anytime that you have a cut or a wound, inflammation is the beginning of the healing process. You're going to have platelets that are components of the blood that sense the micro tears and attach it against the walls to form clots just to stop the bleeding. So then you're gonna have the cholesterol that comes in and it's a component that is used to patch up the damaged vessel walls and that leads to plaque formation. So if you have cholesterol that is oxidized, that only exacerbates the problem. So what happens when you have ongoing hypertension causing continuous vessel damage leading to chronic inflammation? Arthrosclerosis. 
and this is the buildup of cholesterol plaques on the vessel walls in an attempt to repair all the damage that's been going on from hypertension. It also restricts the artery's ability to dilate, leading to a worsening hypertension. The plaques can grow so much that it can cause obstruction of blood flow, leading to poor circulation throughout the whole entire body. This is called peripheral vascular disease. Poor circulation means less blood going to the heart, which is coronary artery disease, or less blood going to the brain, which is cerebral vascular disease, or less blood going to the kidneys, which is renal vascular disease, the intestines, which is ischemic colitis, low blood flow going to the legs, which is claudication, or low blood flow going to the genitals, which is erectile dysfunction. These are all names of the same problem, but just describing their location. When the blood stops flowing to these areas, ultimately you end up with a heart attack, renal failure, leg amputation, or a gangrenous bowel. In the later videos, I will show you how to monitor your stress levels by following a specific indicator, and I'll show you how to manage those stress levels in a methodical way. The fifth reason for chronic inflammation is lack of flossing. Studies a few years ago linked lack of flossing with whole body inflammation and subsequent cardiovascular disease. What happens is when you don't floss, you start to have plaque buildup in the teeth. And then the microbes within the plaque can cause gingival, in, gingival inflammation, which leads to gingivitis. So if you have long-term standing gingivitis, that leads to periodontal disease. And it's been known that periodontal disease has been linked to systemic diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, pneumonia. If you floss daily, you prevent all of that. You prevent the buildup of biofilm and dental plaques and thus prevent inflammation altogether and you live longer. The sixth main reason for chronic inflammation is smoking. Now, smoking, as we all know, is hazardous to our health in many ways. We've known this for about 50 years. It affects virtually every organ in our body. It causes basically oral and lung cancer, emphysema, birth defects, Burgers disease, arthrosclerosis, and the list just keeps on going. But for the purposes of this video, we're gonna be more concer concerned with the cardiovascular effects of smoking. The toxins in cigarettes causes inflammation of the blood vessel walls and leads to arthrosclerosis. Now, in extreme cases like in Burgers disease, vessels can be basically blocked with blood clots as well as plaque. And if smoking continues, you end up with multiple, facing multiple limb amputation. So there you go, six of the most common causes of inflammation. In subsequent videos, we will talk about how to prevent inflammation, more importantly, how to undo the damage of inflammation. So until then, please take your weekly vitamin.